Lecture 11, Threads and Concurrency. This topic picks up immediately following the last one that is the subject of threads in general and having learned a little bit about the pthread and how to work with them. So we learned how to create a new thread. Uh, we learned about what happens when a thread exits uh, and how you can use that to collect a return value or not. Uh, and we did talk about cancellation in that so we're going to examine it in a little more detail now. Thread cancellation is really exactly what it sounds like. It is a thread that is running that will be terminated before it has finished its work. And the thread that we are going to cancel is called the target. Uh, why the target? Because we shoot targets, I guess? I don't know. Um, computer metaphors can be sort of unnecessarily violent, like, you know, using kill as the mechanism for sending a signal. It's like, you know, I only wanted to send a message. Insert joker setting money on fire. Uh, you know, it's about sending a message. Uh, but uh, why it's you know, unnecessarily violent, I couldn't tell you. But target is the recipient of the cancellation notification. Uh, and so if the user presses a cancel button on the file upload, then the user interface thread sends to the file upload thread a cancellation saying, you know, by the way, uh, the user does not wish to continue with the upload of this file. Thing is that there are two forms of cancellation. There is asynchronous cancellation and there is deferred cancellation. And the difference between the two is this. Asynchronous cancellation is that one thread walks up to another thread, pulls a gun, shoots the second thread dead. No warning, no nothing, just you died. Dark Souls ending. Deferred cancellation is, however, one thread sits down and it writes a lovely letter to the second thread that says, Dear other thread, I regret to inform you that you have in fact died. Please dispose of yourself at your soonest convenience. Okay. Uh, the target in deferred cancellation is informed that it is cancelled, and the target is actually responsible for checking that uh, and then cleaning itself up if it is uh, cancelled in a deferred mechanism. And surely you think that the you know, polite way is advantageous. It allows you to, well, clean something up if this is the thread that's going to die, you know, close a file that you have open, um, deallocate memory that you have allocated, that sort of thing. Uh, and pthread attributes can be used to set the cancellation type, uh, however you can uh, also use the uh, pthread cancel type function. Uh, this sets the one for its own uh, thread, so whichever function uh, is calling this, the thread that's running that function uh, is the thread whose attribute is being changed. Uh, and for the type, there are two constants, pthread cancel deferred or pthread cancel asynchronous, which of course correspond to exactly what we have above. And if you care what the previous state was, you can provide a pointer uh, to the old type, which will be updated such that it tells you what the old type was. Okay, so with deferred, um, you know, we are waiting to check if there's a cancellation. Uh, and if we send a cancellation, well, it's done with pthread cancel. Uh, and it takes one parameter, and that is the thread identifier, the target that we wish to cancel. To check if the current thread has been canceled, as was mentioned previously, there is a pthread test cancel function, which takes no parameters. Uh, and, you know, it is polite for a thread to check that, keeping in mind there is a risk that that immediately terminates the caller. Uh, if we did get a letter, pthread te test cancel is what terminates our calling thread. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, uh, if I choose deferred cancellation, what if the other thread doesn't call pthread test cancel? What if it never actually pays attention to that. So why would we ever choose that over asynchronous cancellation? I mean, sure, it's polite to give the other thread an opportunity to clean itself up, uh, and that would be nice, but what if that doesn't happen? Deferred cancellation uh, should work something like this. 
uh, that you have uh, a thread that's going to upload a large number of files, uh, and you know, it's good programming practice to just check pthread test cancel at the start or end of each iteration of the loop. And if cancellation has been signaled, then clean up open files uh, and network connections and all that should basically be done already. Uh, and we're good. We finished uploading a whole file. We will stop before the next one. That's okay. Uh, and assuming your files are not too large, it means that a thread does what it's told and checks to cancel uh, within a certain period of time. It is, of course, a risk uh, that uh, we will terminate uh, by calling pthread test cancel, but we can accept that as long as we're prepared when we call pthread test cancel. Thing is that it is not always the case that a deferred cancellation waits until a pthread test cancel call occurs. A large number of functions, uh, including a great many that we haven't talked about yet, are defined as cancellation points. That is, the specification requires that there is an implicit check for cancellation when calling one of those functions. Uh, and that is to say that if you call this function and our thread has been canceled, well, the operating system just terminates your thread. It doesn't do the thing that you asked for because there is some principle that a dead thread may not initiate this action. If you've been informed of your death, uh, you received that bad news letter, uh, then you can't go off and start a new action. It's worse than that, actually. Um, because there are a large number of functions that are just potential cancellation points. The specification says they could be cancellation points, but maybe they aren't. So you'd actually have to check the spec, first of all, to see if a specific function is a cancellation point, uh, and if it is a potential cancellation point, you might not know that until you actually get to runtime. And now you're thinking, this is bad, this is really bad. Deferred cancellation really means death could come for your thread at any time, because is this function a cancellation point? I don't know. There's a very long list. Who knows? It's hard to tell. And how do I effectively clean things up if my thread could die at any time? Well, good news is there is a mechanism for this. So sometimes a thread is going to die before it has cleaned up. Um, this is either as a result of cancellation points, you know, surprise, this one was a cancellation point, uh, or just use of asynchronous cancellation. A thread might be terminated before it's had a chance to clean up things. So if it was supposed to deallocate memory at the end, um, then cancellation means the memory is not deallocated. That's undesirable. Uh, same thing if it is using some resource, it's got it locked, and this thread is cancelled. Well, again, it doesn't necessarily get unlocked, and that might be a problem. If you kill a process that uh, has a file open, you know, that means the operating system comes in and cleans up and releases the file, but that doesn't happen if a thread dies. The file is open in the process, and it remains open. And so, in the words of the Tenth Doctor, I don't want to go. It's not a good time. Not now. The strategy for dealing with this is a cancellation handler. Uh, and a cancellation handler is, the best analogy I have for this, is your thread writes a will. It says, when I die, I want the following things to happen to my possessions. And you can be as specific as you need to be, saying I want this to happen to this thing, and I want that to happen to that thing, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, writing a will is not a pleasant endeavor. I mean, I, I don't think anybody really enjoys Enjoys the feeling of I'm going to go to the lawyer and then contemplate my mortality uh, and then make arrangements for the disposition of my worldly possessions upon my ascension to Valhalla. I don't think anybody likes that. It's still probably better to do it. You still want to be prepared uh, because uh, it would resolve certain questions that would otherwise <laughs> maybe need to go to court. And if you don't like lawyers, uh, you like them even less when you have to spend more time with them. So the functions for cleaning up are to register a cleanup handler, pthread cleanup push, uh, and you can remove one uh, and possibly carry out the action. We'll see when we dig into that a little bit uh, with pthread cleanup pop. So the function signature for cleanup push uh, takes two arguments. The first is a function, 
as we should be familiar with function pointers by now. That doesn't look too strange anymore, I hope. Uh, and the second is just an argument of any type, void star. Uh, and pthread cleanup pop takes an integer, uh, and the integer in this case is really used like a boolean. Uh, it says if uh, the value here is non-zero, run the corresponding handler, uh, and if it is zero, then don't do it. Okay, um, let's look at it in a little more detail to actually make a bit more sense of it. Uh, it's also important that the push function has to be paired with the pop function at the same level in your program, and level I define as you know, being with the curly braces. So if pthread cleanup push is the first thing that happens in this function, uh, then pthread cleanup pop has to be at that same level, so not in an if statement, not in a, a while loop. Uh, not in some other function call or anything. You have to think of it as though it is a pair of curly braces. Uh, you should think of them as needing to be matched in the same way that when you have an if statement and the if statement has an opening curly brace, it also has a closing curly brace. The same is true for push and pop. Uh, and if a thread is canceled, or if it dies unceremoniously, the cleanup function will run. If execution gets to the pthread cleanup pop statement, you get to choose whether it runs or not based on the argument at the time that pthread cleanup pop is called. So let's consider the following code. We have a function do work. It allocates a struct job. So struct job star j is assigned malloc size of struct job. We do something useful with it, pretend there is some processing that happens here, uh, and we free this memory at the end before going to a pthread exit call with null. It should be obvious that the danger here, based on what we've discussed so far, is that somewhere in the commented out section where it says actual work to do not shown, this thread gets canceled or otherwise dies. If that happens, we never get to the free statement and the memory corresponding to J here is leaked. That shouldn't happen. It should be possible to remedy this with the proper application of a cleanup handler. And that's what happens here. Up at the top, the function that is our cleanup handler. I've called it cleanup, but you may name it anything you like, as is typical with function pointers. Uh, and the only requirements that we really have uh, are the return type must be void. No star on that, just void. Uh, and it takes one argument of type void star. In this case, it is a deallocation handler, so I could have called it you know, free memory uh, or something like that. That would be fine. Uh, and the handler is quite simply just free a pointer to this memory. Then we have our function do work, which now has the following things added to it. So struct job is still allocated the same way. Once that's happened, we invoke pthread cleanup push. Uh, and like the expectation uh, from the names push and pop should, should be generated, um, cleanup handlers are run in order as if they are a stack. So we can have multiple cleanup handlers. You push the first one, you push the second one, you push the third one, and then when they execute, they run in reverse order. So the third cleanup handler runs is popped off the stack, then the second, then the first. Uh, and that is important to remember. So now in this case, what do we do? Uh, in this case, the cleanup handler is registered. We do something useful with this structure. If everything goes well, nothing bad happens. This thread is not canceled. It doesn't die. It, it doesn't terminate. We get to the free statement. The memory is deallocated. And then we get to pthread cleanup pop. Uh, and we call it with zero, which says don't run, uh, which just discards the cleanup handler. And the cleanup handler doesn't do anything and that's fine. The registration says, you know, when this thread dies, the run function cleanup with argument of j, uh, and that's pointing to the memory that we have allocated on the previous line. Okay, uh, if something does happen, we die during the actual work to do not shown comment, uh, something that's actually happening in there and, and this thread dies, then we don't get to the free statement and we don't get to the cleanup pop statement, but the cleanup handler runs automatically and the cleanup handler then deallocates this memory. Not bad. You may note 
incidentally, uh, that you could actually save a line of code by removing the call to free here in do work uh, and just changing pthread cleanup pops argument to be one. Uh, this means the cleanup function does run and it does free the memory that's allocated uh, and therefore you could save yourself a little bit of work uh, and you could save some lines of code and you can also reduce the chance of forgetting things uh, by pushing them into cleanup handlers and then actually making the cleanup handler do the deallocation. And you can reuse a cleanup handler as many times as you want. The one that I wrote here could be used any time you want a cleanup to deallocate memory uh, and there Therefore, you, know, you can reduce a little bit of work. There is another improvement that could be made to this, and it is worth thinking about. So I'll give you a minute. You might have spotted it already, uh, but I'll give you a moment to think about it uh, and try and see what you can come up with. Okay, one of the things that you could be concerned about and could actually potentially happen uh, is that you have the thread cancellation occur after the malloc statement but before pthread cleanup push. So how would you solve that? Okay, I've reopened the example here in the editor. Uh, and what we would like to do is make it so there's no possibility that the memory gets leaked. And my strategy for this will be, first of all, we're going to split up declaration and assignment here of J to be something like this. We will then put our pthread cleanup push And then only after that, we will do the malloc. To make that work, we have to add here some extra check that says if mem is not null, then we try to deallocate it. Okay, what's the, uh, what's the strategy behind this? Well, we, initialize struct job j here to be null we register the cleanup handler so if cancellation happens you know before this uh, this assignment nothing bad happens no heap memory was allocated if cancellation happens here before the cleanup push nothing bad happens here either because again no heap memory has been allocated then if cancellation happens before the malloc the pthread cleanup handler will run uh, and it will in fact do nothing because mem is equal to null at that point uh, and therefore we are okay. Uh, if cancellation happens after the malloc then the memory will be deallocated and I can also show here uh, cleaning up this to say actually uh, do run and so if cancellation takes place at some point uh, in this function, we will not result in a memory leak because we've actually set up our cleanup handler in advance. There's no instant where the cleanup handler is not configured, but the memory has been allocated. And that instant, however small, is an opportunity for the memory to be deallocated, uh, sorry, the memory to fail to be deallocated because uh, of just bad timing of a cancellation. So this should give you an introduction uh, for how to use the cleanup handlers. They are quite useful for making sure that all resources uh, are handled appropriately. You should generally assume that cancellation or anything can happen at any time. Uh, and therefore it is to your interest to use cleanup handlers to see to it that resources are released uh, and dealt with appropriately. Now, if you look very carefully, there's something wrong with this. It's easy to overlook, but here's where things go wrong. If we allocate here struct job j as null, uh, and we call pthread cleanup push with cleanup and j, this um, j pointer itself um, is you know null at this point. Uh, and the pointer is copied based on its value. So the value of null is copied here 
uh, and put to the cleanup function. Uh, and that's not actually what we want. When we, uh, on the next line, line 10, uh, do a malloc and assign the value of j, it assigns the value here uh, of uh, j as expected. That part is fine. However, uh, the argument that we passed to pthread cleanup push, uh, you know, the j that was in there, we made a copy of it, and the copy still says null. So uh, what do we do? What do we do? Well, what we actually need uh, is a pointer to a pointer. Well, I think we know how to do that. Um, it's something that we have uh, encountered, uh, you know, in, hopefully anyway, in, in the code that we've written. Uh, and to do that, what we're going to do is specify that we want to take the address of J. Now the thing is, this kind of thing is slightly dangerous, and it's uh, something I would normally kind of warn you against, because we're saying, all right, we want a pointer to j, except j is a stack allocated variable, uh, and that is to say that there is the possibility, of course, that uh, when we want to use j, it's gone out of scope because we're passing this to some other function. In this case, it's okay because you know, the uh, pointer that is allocated here in do work is allocated in the you know, thread that's going to uh, be started. Uh, so as long as that thread is alive, it will still exist. Uh, and in the cleanup function, we are trying to get rid of stuff on this stack. So uh, it's okay. We expect that this will still exist. We'll still clean it up uh, and then everything will be fine. We do have to, of course, uh, modify uh, our invocation here with cleanup. Uh, and uh, what we are actually going to need to do is dereference this, uh, this memory. Uh, and uh, then to check, of course, if it's null, uh, and then free of mem. Why does that work? Well, if j is assigned uh, a value in hexadecimal a, b, c, d, a, b, c, d um, by the pointer uh, assignment of statement 10, like line 10 in the program, uh, then we need to reference that. Uh, and so our pointer to this value of j is valid. We need to dereference it, check and see if it is still null. Uh, if so, then trying to deallocate it doesn't work. Uh, and then we can deallocate that memory. One thing to watch out for, though, um, your compiler might not take it real well if you actually um, try to compile this. Um, if, if you do that, it might say, well, listen, you're trying to dereference a void pointer, and I'm not sure what to do with that. Uh, why is it not sure what to do with that? Well, uh, because when we dereference a pointer, normally like it specifies there is a certain number of bytes, uh, and so we are making it a little bit clearer to the compiler when we say, oh, actually, you know, there's an int on there uh, that size of integer is how many bytes we are expecting to reference, uh, and the compiler probably doesn't know what to do with this. Okay. Well, what do we have to do? Um, just cast it. Uh, and what we actually have is void double star. Uh, and we'll just cast it as we need. Uh, and then the compiler will know what to do when we try to dereference it. Remember, um, void star star is just a pointer to a pointer, and the compiler knows that, okay, what we're talking about here is of pointer size. Uh, and that would be sufficient to actually get the job done. Um, sometimes you can skip that, uh, and you can, you know, uh, the compiler won't complain about this, but probably it will. So it's better to avoid it, uh, and we'll just do a cast. This is also an opportunity for me to remind you that when we do something like this, when we are doing a cast here, it is not um, allocating more memory on the heap. This is um, just going to have another pointer that's pointing to the same memory location as mem. We're just saying we'd like to pretend it is a different type now, uh, and the compiler, of course, then has a better idea of what code to generate 
when we ask it to make it. But okay, uh, now that we've got our cleanup handlers all set up uh, and working, uh, we should be able to put this to use in making sure that our programs don't leak memory, even if something kind of goes wrong. All right, we are going to go on to our next example uh, with uh, our, our good friend here, Count Von Count. Uh, and we're going to do an example that shows you the attributes, in case you care about that. Uh, and for the sake of simplicity, the purpose of this program is we're just going to count. The program doesn't do useful work, but that's fine. All I really needed was the idea of how to use attributes and how to make the program do a thing. So here is a quick example of a slightly larger one where we use attributes. As I said, default attributes will be fine. In this case, we're showing using the attribute structure even though we just take the defaults anyway, uh, and therefore you could save yourself this work. But here we are. Uh, so we declare a sum variable at the top. We have our function prototype here called runner. Uh, we will declare a set of thread attributes after the thread identifier and its pthread attrt. Uh, it, this program takes an integer value. We will try to convert it. Uh, if something is wrong, we will tell the user they picked a bad value. We initialize attributes here. It's pthread attribute init. We call pthread create using those attributes as the second argument. Uh, we join. We collect the result here from the global variable sum, uh, and then we destroy the attributes as needed. The uh, complement part here uh, is this runner function that we got a prototype of earlier, which converts the parameter uh, and tries to count up to a certain sum. Now looking over this program briefly, both of the threads are sharing a global variable sum, and we should ask the question, do we have coordination between the two? I'll go back so you can look over this as well. Uh, the answer should be yes. Sum is a global variable and is in principle accessible from every thread. However, uh, it is used in only really two places. It's used here in, uh, in this case where uh, sum is printed by main, uh, and sum is assigned zero, and then it's incremented here in runner. However, the nature of the program is that the thread is created here with pthread create, uh, and then is immediately joined. Uh, and so main is waiting until the newly created thread is done. Uh, and sum is not accessed in main until after the runner thread has exited. That does mean that we have a mechanism of coordination in the same way that we have used wait and pthread join previously to ensure that our shared variables are only being accessed by one thread at a time, and there's no possibility that we try to print the sum too early when the result is not ready. So our uh, reasoning is, of course, supported by the slides. It says, yes, the parent thread will join the newly spawned thread before it tries to print out the value, but we want to do a different take on the program, and uh, our powers have doubled since the last time we met. We're going to do a slightly different version of that program now. The program we're looking at here is effectively the same as the one that's in the slides, so we're just going to uh, look at it here in the code editor so we can compile it and run it and see how we do. So uh, we include our usual libraries, including the pthread library. We have our variable int sum is assigned zero, uh, declared as a global variable, which is there initialized. Uh, we have our function prototype runner, uh, and we have a main function. A main function creates uh, a stack allocated array of three pthread t structs, which we call tid. Uh, if argument count is not two, an integer value is required as an argument. Uh, if the provided argument can't be parsed into an integer, um, or it's less than zero, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, and uh, we will also uh, create three threads, and then we will join three threads. Now, uh, here at line 19, we have you know, a for loop that creates these three threads, uh, each of which calls the runner function with this uh, argv at 
uh, index one, so whatever the first parameter is, assuming it checked some uh, uh, some assuming it checked out. Uh, now you might be thinking, can I create uh, the threads and then use join in the same loop, and therefore save myself from having two distinct for loops that both go f from zero to two? The answer to that is no, because that would serialize your program. It would make it um, not run in parallel the way that we want. Uh, and at that point, there's no benefit to having these multiple threads because we're just running them one at a time. So why have three of them? It doesn't make sense. So you might think you're saving some time and saving some writing by saying, oh, I can combine these two loops, but you can't. It doesn't do what we think it does. So we create three threads and then we wait for all of those threads to be finished and then we print the sum uh, and then we finally exit from main. The runner thread uh, does also more or less the same thing that we saw earlier. Uh, it uh, parses the parameter to figure out how high it should count, uh, and it does for int i equals 1, uh, i less than or equal to upper, whatever argument was provided, i plus plus, uh, and then sum plus equals i, uh, and then when this is finished with its loop, it will print f that a thread has finished. Uh, and then it will return. Okay, so let's compile and run this program. Okay, we expect it requires an argument, so if you give a non-integer value, it take, treats it as zero. But okay, that makes sense. Um, if uh, we provide an explicit argument of zero, the sum should be zero because having three threads count to zero obviously is, is easy. Uh, so, okay, let's make the argument 10. And the sum is 165. Okay, that, does that match with our expectation? Does that match with our expectations? I mean, sure, we are you know, counting here from you know, i equals one, I this, sum plus equals i, and we have three threads that are doing it. What about a hundred? A thousand? Somewhere Gauss is either ecstatic or crying. Okay. With 10,000, wait a minute, those two sums are different. In fact, every time I run it with 10,000, I'm getting a different answer. Uh, and it gets worse if you make it 100,000. Uh, eventually, of course, we'll run up against you know, the uh, maximum value of an integer. Uh, and this time we got a negative number. This time we got a negative number. We have some sort of integer overflow, and we ended up with a negative number. What's wrong here? What's wrong here? Why is this different than the previous example? Yeah, the problem is, uh, and I'm, I'm imagining, you know, in a classroom somebody would have said this out loud, uh, is that we actually don't have the coordination that we should. If I open up this code again, what about sum? Well, sum is accessed here in main, but it's accessed in runner, actually here on, on several occasions, uh, in this loop. And we have three threads, and each thread is executing this function runner all at the same time. And we have multiple threads now that are trying to write to the same global variable all at the same time. And there isn't the coordination that we need to make this always produce a consistent answer. So why do we get the wrong answer? Well, because we have conflicting rights. So how do we fix that? Well, we make it so the rights don't conflict with one another. We make them take turns so they're not happening at the exact same time. And I used a phrase, at the same time, but what does that mean in the context of a program? You have some intuition about what it means when we talk about you know, two things happen at the same time you know, in the human world when we are thinking about you know, did, did Alice uh, eat lunch at the same time as Bob? 
there's a certain understood meaning to at the same time, but we need a more formal definition for our computer program. Journey with me back in time. Not that long ago. Okay, that's relative. Every year it gets farther in the past, and maybe it's sufficient to say actually reasonably long time ago. But, you know, in the 1990s, a typical computer had one processor, one CPU, with one core. And it would accordingly really be only able to do exactly one thing at a time. And when I say one processor, I mean one general purpose processor that executes user processes. There can be additional special purpose processors in the system. Uh, a RAID controller, a sound card. Nobody has sound cards anymore unless you're a pro audio person. Uh, but sound cards used to be uh, a thing, uh, but there's only one general purpose processors. Um, the graphics card actually might seem like a more obvious example, but um, the graphics card can be used for general purpose computation, so uh, it, it does not count here as a special purpose device. Uh, but when we have only one general purpose processor, we call it a uniprocessor system. Uh, and lots of models uh, and uh, reasoning about how computers work are based on a model that has one CPU. That's not to say you can only have one program open at a time, but the CPU will be working on only one thing at a time, and it might pause it and go work on something else and then come back to it later, but that is a uniprocessor system. But, of course, the dark ages have ended. Now, your desktop, your laptop, your cell phone, they all have multi-core processors, right? They, they can do a lot of things in parallel. A quad-core processor could be executing, in principle, if you stopped it and you know, examined what it was doing, it could be in the middle of executing four different instructions from four different threads at the same time. Uh, and this actually gives us lots of advantages, uh, one of which is that potentially we can accomplish more work done in the same amount of wall clock time, and this is not a guarantee. Uh, but there are lots of programs that do benefit from being able to use multiple cores, multiple CPUs, uh, and that is very helpful. So as a terminology note, I just use the term core, and you know, we've talked about quad core, and probably have an understanding of it, but let's be complete. Uh, we often refer to a logical processing unit as a core. CPU, or central processing unit, may be used to refer to a physical chip, uh, and the physical chip might contain one or more logical processing units. As far as we are concerned, and as far as the operating system is concerned, it doesn't matter if a system has four cores, those are logical processing units, in four physical chips that are on the motherboard, or four of them all in one physical chip. It doesn't really matter. There's four units that can execute instructions, and that's really the important thing. The physical layout of it is not very relevant to this discussion, uh, and so we can just assign work, uh, and if there are four cores, well, then the scheduler will choose to assign that work to those cores. What their physical layout is doesn't matter. Now, that requires, of course, that your process has to be able to take advantage of it. Uh, and if you write a program such that it has one process with one thread, it doesn't matter how many cores are available. At most, one core can be used to execute this task. And if there are multiple processes, every process can execute on a different core. And the same is true with threads, uh, that if there are multiple threads, every thread could execute on a different core. And you can ask, but what happens if there are more processes and threads than there are available cores? Well, that's, that's an ordinary day. Um, you could imagine, you can hope, that the processes get blocked frequently enough and long enough such that all processes get to run, but you can't actually count on that behavior. You don't really know what the resource demands are going to be, and you know, processes and threads can behave arbitrarily. Uh, and they could have lots of work to do or not very much work to do, and you can't really know that in advance. This image um, hurts much more uh, due to, uh, at the time of recording, uh, you know, gyms have been closed for uh, about a month. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, waiting for, uh, for a bench on chest day when gyms reopen again is probably going to look like this. But you know, can I work in with you? Um, okay. 
Uh, the thing is that, like, what happens when a resource is in much higher demand than there is supply? Well, I mean, you know, you take turns. That's something I hope that you learned, you know, in, in elementary school or kindergarten or preschool even, which is that you can take turns, uh, and by taking turns, it's better for everybody because, you know, everybody gets a chance to get some service. Uh, they get a chance to get uh, some of the resource that is in high demand. Uh, and while it doesn't uh, necessarily... It doesn't necessarily make everybody totally happy. You know, if uh, Arnold is there and he wants to do a four-hour workout, uh, he might not be totally happy uh, with this, but ultimately you know, resources are limited and a little bit of fairness is appreciated. So what actually happens is that the operating system scheduler will cause the CPU to switch between different tasks, and tasks in this case is a thread or a process, uh, via a procedure called time slicing. And time slicing just says we're going to cut up uh, whatever time uh, we have for execution into little pieces, into little slices, and then we'll hand out those slices to uh, individual threads or processes. So if thread one wants to execute, it can execute for up to its uh, time slice limit. So it runs for just making up a number 20 milliseconds. Uh, and then its turn is up. The scheduler runs. It forces uh, thread one to stop and starts thread two. Thread two can run for its 20 millisecond time slice, then thread three, uh, and so on and so on, alternating through the threads, eventually going back to thread one. From the perspective of the user, it does feel like all three tasks, uh, all three threads are being executed in parallel because the switches between them are quick enough that the user really doesn't notice the difference. Uh, obviously, the CPU is only working on one thing at the given moment, uh, but it feels to the user like a lot is happening uh, in parallel. It's concurrent. We do have more than one thread in progress at, a same, at the same time, but it's not parallel in a single core execution kind of world. Uh, and this is another textbook diagram that is beautiful and symmetric and you know, everything is wonderful. You know, every thread takes its turn one after the other and there's exactly four of them and every time slice is the same size and there's never any problems and nothing ever finishes or gets blocked or anything like that. Not really true, uh, but just to give you an idea of taking turns, this diagram is acceptable. Now, time slicing will still occur, as is necessary when we have a multi-core system. So imagine this dual core system where core 1 is alternating between T1 and T3, and core 2 is alternating between threads 2 and 4. Uh, and again, super unrealistic that you know, these things are always perfectly synchronized, and they always take the exact same amount of time. And they, you know, core 1 only executes thread 1 and thread 3, and you know, threads never move between cores. None of those things are true. Uh, so don't uh, read too much into this diagram. Uh, it's just showing you that there can be uh, some execution of different threads at the same time on different cores, and we still have time slicing to make that happen. So, okay, it's occurred to you that if there are multiple threads running at the same time, it could mean that a task is completed faster. And I say it could mean that because it depends a lot on the nature of the task that we want to execute. So the nature of our task determines how well we can speed it up by using multiple threads. If in the ideal case, the problem that we want to solve is what is referred to as embarrassingly parallel or trivially parallelizable, then doubling the threads doubles the uh, speed in which this can be executed. Um, there is usually overhead uh, involved with this, uh, and uh, the overhead is hopefully small enough to make the parallelism worth your while. So I'll give you an example. Imagine we're painting an apartment uh, and we'll say it would take one person 12 hours to paint the whole apartment. Uh, and if you had two people, those two people could complete the job in six hours. 
Okay, that is you know, a fully parallelizable type problem. Uh, there is a certain amount of overhead. They do have to discuss uh, who is going to paint what section. So you know, I'll start in the bedroom and you start in the kitchen. Uh, and those kinds of things uh, do count as time. They are overhead and that wouldn't be necessary if it was just one person who was going to do the whole job. That one person would just start painting wherever and they would eventually have to get to all of the surfaces that need to be painted. Painted. But by having two people, uh, then there was a little bit of coordination. However, the one minute of coordination that they spent talking about, you know, here, I'm, I'm going to start over here and you will start over there, is negligible compared to the six hours it takes them to paint the apartment. Uh, and this pattern continues because painting uh, is one of those jobs that is easily parallelizable. Uh, and that is if you had three people, you could complete the same job in four hours. If you had four people, it would take three hours. If you had 12 people, it would take one hour. Uh, and that is the ideal. Now in the real world, there will eventually be some limitations uh, to how many additional workers you can add and continue to have that kind of speed up characteristic. At some point, adding more threads uh, just adds non-negligible overhead uh, and uh, even in the analogy this does eventually happen if you hired 720 painters you could finish the job in one minute uh, but at some point you can't fit 700 people into the apartment uh, it just doesn't work so things that are uh, fully parallelizable, um, transaction processing might be an example of something that is, if not fully parallelizable, then very close to it, uh, if all of the transactions are independent. You know, if we are calculating the interest that's added to your savings account at the end of the month, how much interest is being added to your savings account probably not very much, is not any different than the interest that's being added to my savings account also not very much, and the amounts uh, are of uh, interest are added based only on your account. So we could easily do this in parallel because there's no, there's no coordination needed. We don't have to check anything. Uh, we can just do each calculation independently. Other tasks are partially parallelizable. It means the task can be divided and there is some benefit to doing so, uh, but doubling the workers doesn't result in completing the job in half the time. So two chefs working on, you know, on a single order in the kitchen uh, could speed up getting the order out. It might take, let's say, 75% of the time it would take one chef to cook the meal. So adding an extra worker to the kitchen, it did improve the speed. Uh, at which food was prepared, but the speed didn't double. The time was not cut in half. The time is only 75% of what it was uh, before. Why does this happen? Well, ultimately because, you know, in this analogy where we are you know, making a meal, there is a need for more coordination. Chefs can work independently some of the time. You know, you are... You know, cooking the chicken uh, and uh, the other chef is you know making the sauce and uh, and creating the uh, the uh, french fries so they can be fried that's fine they can work independently some of the time but there are dependencies there are situations where one chef has to wait for the other you can't put the sauce on the chicken until the chicken comes out of the oven you, know, you can't plate the dish uh, correctly until you have all of the elements there are synchronization points there are coordination uh, elements that make it uh, impossible to just have each chef proceed independently and then there are tasks that cannot be parallelized at all. Um, in that case, no amount of extra workers will speed it up. Some tasks can really only be done sequentially. Uh, if you are cooking a steak, uh, you cannot cook the steak in one minute by putting it in five ovens. That ruins the steak and makes the chef incredibly mad. Where's the lamb sauce? Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, when you are cooking the steak, it is uh, a sequential process, uh, again, so it takes the amount of time that it takes, and you can't speed it up by having more chefs, and you can't speed it up by having more ovens, uh, and if you cut the steak up into five pieces, you ruin the steak, and you're fired, or at least going home from the competition. Okay, let's do a numerical example of this. 
Suppose that we have a task uh, that is normally executed in five seconds, and it contains a loop, and the loop is of the sort that it could be parallelized. Uh, we'll imagine that the code for the overhead, you know, so initializing it and handing out the work and all of that and recombining the results, uh, will take 400 milliseconds. So with one processor executing it, it takes 400 milliseconds out of the 5 seconds for the overhead, and it takes 4.6 seconds to execute the body of the loop. Uh, and if we add to that uh, our, our setup time, we get 5 seconds, as makes sense. Now if we can split up the loop and execute it on two processors, it takes 2.3 seconds to execute the loop. The setup and cleanup time does not change, and our total time is 2.7 seconds. Completing this task in 2.7 seconds instead of 5 is a speed up of about 46%. I at least would consider a speed up of 46% to be pretty good. Now, a uh, smart fellow by the name of Gene Amdahl came up with a formula for the general case that allows you to estimate how much faster your, uh, your task can be completed based on how many processors are available, uh, and also tells you about the theoretical maximum speed up that we could get. So Gene Amdahl came up with this formula uh, for the general case of, of this, uh, and the formula is written as is shown on the bottom of the slide. We'll define S as the fraction of the application that must be performed serially, and N as the number of processing cores available. So S is a number between 0 and 1, uh, and N is an integer, which is how many CPU cores are available for our task. So the speed up is ultimately limited to being less than or equal to 1 over s plus and then 1 minus s, so the fraction of the program that can be done in parallel, divided by n. So this is a relatively simple math formula. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is in figuring out how much of the program is sequential, like what is the size of the s term. The number of cores is potentially easy to tell. You know, we're going to deploy this on a server that has eight cores. We know the answer to n, but s is somewhat more difficult to estimate. In this example that we are talking about, uh, of course, um, we have already some figures in mind for what the sequential portion of the program is, so that part is, uh, is easy, but in real life it's a little harder to measure. Now this is a math formula, and uh, we can take the limit as n approaches infinity, uh, and if you do that, you find that the speed up converges to 1 divided by s, uh, and that means that the limiting factor on how much additional processors help this program to execute uh, is... Well, how much of the program is sequential? How much of it can be done in parallel? And I think that matches our intuition about how this is supposed to work. If the task is completely sequential, then you know, the speed up is 1 over 1, which is 1, so no speed up at all. Uh, if the task is completely parallel, then it will be something that uh, it's 1 divided by you know, 0, really, so it's infinite. Um, so we could have infinite speed up with infinite processors. Okay, so if we apply the formula to uh, the example from earlier, we'll get the following run times as shown in the table. So our initial state where the code that was, uh, was just sequential is uh, 5 seconds. And by splitting it up, we have the uh, 400 milliseconds of setup and cleanup time and the 2.3 seconds uh, producing a time for 2.7. With four CPUs, we finish uh, in 1.55 seconds. With eight, uh, 9.75, 16 is 0 0.6875, and so on and so on. Uh, all the way down to you know, when we go from 64 to 128 cores, uh, we go from 0 0.47 seconds to 0 0.44 seconds. Okay. Two observations, I think, uh, as we look at this. Number one, we get diminishing returns uh, as we add more processors. Going from 1 to 2 reduced the runtime quite a lot, uh, but going from 64 to 128 really only decreased the runtime a small amount. 
So, um, I mean, it was at one time the case where it was like, you know, oh, you know, you have a, a 64-core uh, machine or 128-core machine, you know, can I borrow it? But that's actually no longer implausible. Those kinds of machines uh, can be built. Uh, they're expensive still, uh, and if you are watching this video long into the future where everyone has a thousand core machines, uh, then you might be like, you know, remember back in the Dark Ages when you know, videos were only 1080p and we only had 64 cores in, in our CPU? How did we ever get any work done? Uh, but, you know, for, for the uh, typical laptop, that's still a little bit out of reach, at least at the time when I record this. Now, the other thing that we should observe is that the numbers are converging on 0 0.4 uh, and that fits our expectation of what would happen if we had infinite processors the serial part takes 0 0.4 seconds no matter what and with infinite processors the parallel part would be effectively instant uh, and that means that our speed up is limited by that sequential part uh, and so if we just sub in the formula it's uh, 5 divided by 0 0.4 is approximately equal to 12.5 and so no matter how much money we throw at the problem, no matter what else we do, there's no beating that speed up uh, for the program that we are, that we are looking at. So um, ultimately, um, we'll never quite reach it because that requires infinite processors and infinite money, but you can get practically quite close to it. So the only way to improve from there is to reduce the sequential part of the program. Can we find a way to parallelize more things? Can we find a way to reduce the sequential part of the program just by you know, not doing things we don't need to do? If that topic interests you, um, then there is, of course, uh, the fourth year technical elective, which I usually teach, ECE 459, Programming for Performance. Uh, and we will spend time thinking about how do you parallelize things and how do you decrease the sequential part of program. Uh, but there are lots of ways in which that course uh, extends from the current one, but I will attempt to refrain from making too many references to it, otherwise I have to put money in the swear jar every single time, uh, and that gets quite expensive. So I hope that you recall from data structures and algorithms the concept of a merge sort. Uh, and merge sort is a divide and conquer algorithm, and you've probably learned about a number of divide and conquer algorithms. The first one I think that you were likely to have talked about is a binary search. Uh, and binary search, uh, again, is a divide and conquer in that you split up the array into two halves and you figure out assuming the array is sorted, um, which half the data will be in if it is going to be found, uh, and therefore you reduce the size of the search space quite significantly every single time instead of a linear search where you check everything. Okay, now the binary search works only if the array is sorted, and we need to sort the array uh, to make that happen, and merge sort is an example of a divide and conquer sorting algorithm. Uh, and the basic strategy for merge sort is we'll split the array of values up into some smaller pieces. Uh, we will sort the smaller pieces and then we will recombine those smaller pieces together to produce some sorted data. So visually, uh, a merge sort looks something like this. Obviously, uh, a real example would not have a list of so few elements. Uh, it becomes impractical to use merge sort uh, below, oh, I don't know, about 30 elements. Uh, once you're in that range, I think uh, for efficiency, you should use something like uh, insertion sort uh, but that, or, or selection sort, um, but that's fine. Uh, as, as far as we're going to look at this, assume that we have a much bigger list uh, and that uh, it is going to work out. Obviously, when the list is this small, the overhead of the divide and conquer makes it not worth your while, but assume that this uh, is a bigger, uh, a bigger list. And the idea that we are going to think about is you know, given what we know, we have a list and we can split it into smaller pieces. Can we assign those smaller pieces to different threads? So each thread sorts 
its piece of the list, and then we recombine them all, potentially in another thread, uh, the merge thread, which takes the results from the sorting threads. And this would actually allow us to get the work done quite significantly faster. Uh, it is desirable, I think, to you know, make the sort happen as quickly as it can, and we can speed up one of the slow steps, uh, and one of the slow steps is actually sorting the smaller sub-pieces. Now, again, this is only worth your while assuming that you have a big enough uh, list for the overhead to, uh, to be worth it. Uh, the overhead that we would introduce when we introduced a parallel merge sort would be in how do we split up the, uh, the list into its different subparts and how do we assign those to threads. Uh, and then we have to start the threads. The threads will run. Uh, the threads do have some startup cost when they actually execute. And the threads have to return a result of some sort. Uh, and then we have to collect all of those results and then combine them in the merge thread. So there will be a little bit of extra work, but it will be worth it. And a merge sort is a great example of how we do it. However, uh, as we got into the uh, topic of concurrency, uh, we should have sort of realized at this point that this only works well and we only get the right answer if we have appropriate coordination of those different threads. And therefore, we're going to have to spend quite a lot of time learning about how to properly coordinate these threads uh, above and beyond what we already know with weight and join kind of mechanics. So we will pick that up in the next video where we're going to talk about uh, synchronization as a topic.